You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. And now, here are your hosts, Sarah and Esteban. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 145. Today's podcast is brought to you by Elite Science. Unlock your athlete's full potential with a unique competitive edge solution, 1TDC. One tetradecanol complex is a patented blend of unique fatty acid oils designed to safely and effectively keep joints and muscles at their best to maximize performance and shorten recovery time. 1TDC is the next generation of fatty acids beyond glucosamine and fish oil and is used by many current and past national agility champions and world team members. Bad Dog Agility listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at bda1tdc.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Back on Track. Dog agility is a demanding sport and can be difficult on the body, both the dogs and the humans. Back on Track specializes in dog blankets, beds, and wraps that keep muscles warm and reduce the pain in joints. If you've got a nagging knee, calf, or ankle injury, Back on Track's human products can help get you back in the ring. Visit Back on Track at backontrackproducts.com. Today, we're going to be giving you some tips for course building in your own backyard. And I'm going to be giving you the super secret to my success in course building in my own backyard. This is actually a question that I got just today from one of our VIP members talking about one of the practice courses that we had available as part of that course. And it occurred to me that we just assume that people know how to build a course from a course map. And while everybody can probably take a course map and somehow get it all laid out, there are some tricks that make the whole thing easier and go faster. So we thought we'd talk about some of those today. And I think it's important to note that we're not talking about course building at an actual trial for a specific organization, right? There's probably different um, customs and ways of doing things in each organization, not just here in the United States, but also abroad. So if you're an official course builder or if you are a judge, feel free to roll your eyes here at some of the advice we're going to give. So this is more of the backyard stuff. Um, the only kind of course building I've ever done at a trial is just as an assistant where they say, hey, help us move yeah. the dog walk here, move right. the seesaw here. I don't want to be in charge at a do trial. That. And, right, but in I've, our never, own... I've never had to tweak it as the judge or anything. That's right. But in our own backyard, we, we are in charge. We're the ones setting the course. And, and so uh, we make all of those decisions. So the first thing that I want to talk about is a full course because that's um, what the question was about. We had a, a complicated international 28 obstacle, you know, know, 110 by 100 foot course that we were setting with just a few people. And the way that we do that and have found to be the easiest is to, number one, first get a hold of a course map that has coordinates on it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Clean Run Course Designer, this is a program that the majority of people use in the United States to create course maps. And one of the things that you can output from that program is a course map with all of the obstacles that shows actual X, Y coordinates of the obstacles relative to, you know, the side or the middle of the course. So in feet. So you have a jump that is, you know, five feet north and six feet east sort of thing. And so we start with a course that has those coordinates and the first thing we do is we lay out a center line. So a center line is just taking a uh, a tape measure and you can get these at Home Depot, not the kind that's going to roll in by itself, but one that you can um, stretch out and just kind of lay on the ground. And we'll stake that down and that gives you basically your Y coordinate for every obstacle. And then uh, we take a wheel. So just like the judges use to wheel a course, we've invested in a wheel to, for our practice field. And for every obstacle on your course, uh, it'll have the Y coordinate in feet, and then it will have an X coordinate in feet. So on your center line, you find your Y coordinate, and then you wheel across from that uh, to your X coordinate, and that's your jump. And then you set your jump up, get the angle um, to match your course map as close as you can. 
And we do that for every obstacle on course. Uh, and then in that way, we don't necessarily, uh, for a full course, measure every obstacle from every other obstacle. All the obstacles are just set according to their coordinates based on the center line and based on a wheel. And then at the end of that process, now we're going to kind of look at the course as a whole and walk it um, from number to number in the order that the dog's going to take it and make sure that it all makes sense, that it's all safe, and that the challenges that we see on paper are reflected in the course itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good outline, and it's something that I almost never do. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that Sarah at all is wrong. The way she's doing it is is a great way to do it. but years, for years, I think, before we had, you know, a, a tape measure and kind of looked at it that way, or or even the uh, wheel. And I just looked up on HomeDepot.com, the wheel that we have, at least right now, is selling for about $60, the yes. large wheel. So, yep. you know, it is a little bit of a chunk of change. So I, this is my secret tip right here. And it's not even a tip, it's my secret fact. My foot it's 12 inches long in a shoe. That is so not fair. This is actually very true. Okay, so. Whenever we course build with his thumb on, he paces things off because his foot is exactly a foot. It's so not fair. So one block here in the United States. So this is an important distinction to make, uh, especially because uh, even some of our VIPs and people who use our material are not from the United States where, where they use feet. So they don't they don't do that. Uh, it's meters, right? They use meters. Yes, meters. Yeah, so I'm always having to back convert and, and things like that. And um, Sarah, you should probably have so, or share your cool tricks in Course Designer from for converting one to the other. Oh, but, I'm planning on it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, um, back to my feet. So each box is 10 by 10, so I can literally pace off 10 feet. And so just from looking at the map, you can kind of estimate where an obstacle is. So you can say, okay, this one's about here, so it's about seven feet. So I'm gonna pace off seven feet, stick the wing here, and angle the jump away. The most important key point I think that Sarah gave was you have to check the relationships of the obstacles. It matters because of the challenges. So there, and this requires a little bit of knowledge of course design and, and a little bit of understanding of what judges are trying to accomplish. Because it's possible to design a course that looks basically the same, but because you move something two or three feet closer, you've made something significantly easier than the judge intended, like some kind of fine discrimination after a long line. And so uh, even the tunnels, which are always very hard to do, and they move around a lot, and they can be kind of pointed one way, even though they're in the correct position, um, the exit of the tunnel and how dogs exit can also greatly impact uh, something. So it's important to understand those relationships. So you kind of want to walk through the course. So Sarah was talking about walking through the course. You want to look for unsafe things. But you also want to look for, oh, I think the judge want, was really trying to test this here. And sometimes, honestly, I'll you can even make it a little bit harder. But one thing, as the courses become more complex, and this especially speaks to the international stuff, uh, in some of the courses you'll see, it's say the AKC National Finals, the Invitational, where you come through a certain area more than once, two, three, four times. The relationship is not linear, right? So when you move one jump, you're not affecting just the obstacle line from two to three. Now you're going to also affect the line coming back through that spot, 13 to 14. And then in the closing, 19 and 20. So each time the dog handler comes through there, they're taking a different set of two obstacles so that tweaking one can affect all these other lines. And so as the course becomes more complex, not not better design, just I guess a, a different kind of design, right? So a novice course, the relationships are very straightforward. The doc, you know, the judges kind of just want to move you around in a loop with a side change and things like that. Much easier to build. You can even deviate a little from the map or even quite a bit and still basically get the challenge, right? Well, the point here is, can the handler change sides? Um, here, they can do it while the dog is in the tunnel. It's really not that big a deal. But as you get into these more complex courses, the spatial relationships are very, very important. And so if I have to sacrifice something when I'm designing the course, I will say, okay, what's the hardest thing for our dogs here? What can our dogs already do? Oh, they can already do this? Okay, then that spatial relationship is a little less important. I'm going to move it a foot this way. And the reason that I became so good 
I should say we as a, as a group, but I would often have to uh, say, okay, put this here. We're going to do that here. So kind of taking the lead on all this. The reason that we had to is because when we were getting ready for these international courses and stuff, you know, we don't run on them every day, right? In our local trials. So we would try and do like two or three courses a week for several weeks where you only run basically for like 30 seconds, two or three times, right? So you After mi- like a 30 minute build. Yeah, it's like a 30 minute build, a 10 minute walk, you know, upwards of an hour. And then you're going to run for a grand total of like one minute and 30 seconds, you know? But in that way, you get exposure to a lot of different courses. And so we would be putting up courses and taking them down. Uh, we would definitely try and run uh, different versions of things on the same course, right? Um, not, not, I'm not talking about numbering backwards. I'm talking about like, oh, well, if it's a backside the first time through, then at this junction, we're going to do a, a throttle. Uh, yeah, really, that almost thing. at that point, you're talking about contrast training. So yeah, yeah. You've we would tested do, we would one skill. Training. Now you want to do the opposite, partly because your dog is anticipating one thing. And so it really tests their response right, and their handling. Right. But that, like I guess that. that's kind of getting off right, on, that, the, on right. the side here. So exactly. get, back to the course building. Yeah. So my foot is the magic. But um, the other tip that I'll give is, um, and this is a legitimate tip, we always start with the big, difficult-to-move obstacles. Well, so here is where I think um, the center line can really change the way that we build courses. So before we used a center line and used the, the wheel, and that's why I wanted to give these tips, because I built a lot of things for a long time without using a center line. And before that, but you just using a wheel. And before that, I built a lot of things without using a wheel. And when I added those two elements, the building was so much easier and so much faster. And, and that's really why I wanted to to give people that um, option for building a course. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you only have a wheel, or even when you're pacing things off, you have to pace off an X and a Y, right? You mm-hmm. have to go, you, you look at the map and you're, you, whatever you start with, let's say you build a tunnel first and now you're going to go set a jump. You have to say, well, I'm going to take five feet, uh, I'm going to walk five feet up, and then I'm going to walk seven feet across, right? And you have to do those two different pacings. When you have the center line, that center line takes care of one of those. So all you have to do is find your number and then go across a certain amount. And so I found that when we started doing that, we ended up with a lot less tweaking needing to be done. And the whole thing was able to be set faster. And it didn't really matter um, what we started with because everything started from the center line. So we could just, you know, kind of build the course really quickly that way. And Actually, if you had two wheels, you could probably do it twice as fast with two people, you know, one person taking one half of the field and the other person taking the other. I think another, but but this is something that we only do for large courses. Now, if I'm setting something like in a 50 by 50 space, I'm not going to bother with the center line. I, I'm going to, you know, probably like you said, take the biggest thing. Uh, if it's a small space exercise, that's almost certainly a tunnel. You're, not, if you have a 50 by 50 space, you're probably not going to be doing exercises with the dog walk, for instance. Uh, and you know, I'm going to set that, and then I'm going to set my my other obstacles relative to that. No matter what you're setting, one thing that you do need to have is some sort of reference point. And so um, in a lot of fields, that's going to be like a fence line, right? Mm-hmm. Or the house. You need something where you can put your back to something and, and know uh, which way's up and which way's down and which way's side to side, right? Yes. Um, if you have no it's a lot markers. harder to build in an open field. Yeah, if you had no... a, right. If you had a, if you were in a complete open field, it'd be very difficult. You have to pick a reference point that you make, you know, your back or your forwards or, you know, yeah. line up your your paper grid with. Yeah. So, you know, for in our field, we use the fence. In our friend's field, we use a building. But we're always using that as our frame of reference. Yes. The other piece of advice that I want to give, though, about course building is to also let go a little bit. And I need to take my own advice here because I am very – detail oriented is the nicest way, the nice way of saying it. Sure. And, uh, you know, like when Esteban is using his feet, I, I'm like 
gritting my teeth because I want to check it with, you know, a measuring device. Turns out I'm it's an engineer. highly accurate, accurate. It is highly accurate. He's convinced me. And so I've let that go. But, but my point is that I have to battle the feeling of trying to get everything exactly, exactly, exactly perfect because first of all, it's almost never going to happen. And it, and let me tell you one thing that I've started to see. It doesn't happen in real trials either. <laughs> you know, it's not exactly, exactly like the map. If you watch them build, they're, they, you know, there are going to be variations. And what matters for you and your dog is what you are running. It does not matter what is on the paper. What matters is what you're running. So anytime you are building a course and then, and then when you're running it, you have to kind of throw that, once you have it on the field, you kind of have to mentally throw that paper away and go walk what is on the field. Oh, because yeah. very, very small differences can have a very, very big effect. Yeah, so for the beginners that are listening, especially for those of you involved in online classes where course maps are provided to you, small little sequences for you to set up at home, you go and you take those home and your instructor's kind of giving you a way to run it. And then you run it and you're like, wait, this, you know, this isn't working or it's too tight here. Um, you know, just understand that there's going to be uh, differences, right? That it's uh, very difficult to reproduce exactly two courses in different places, even from looking at the same map. Right. And not only that, but you really, in that case, have three different things. You have the course map, you have how your instructor set it up, right, with whatever human error there is there, right, and then how you set it up with whatever human, there, human error there is there. And now, uh, related to that, at the AKC National Agility Championship, they have the same course in multiple rings. And we have a hard time. So, you know, I ran 20 inches this, this last year, 26 right. the year before. And say my friends would be in the 20 inch ring, the 12 inch ring, the 16 inch ring. And when we're talking about a course, we're talking about the same course, but guess what? It's not the same course. It's not the same course. There's subtle differences. So I would look and I'd be like, Oh my goodness, in our ring, these two jumps are very close together. You know, like I'm going to do this. And I would go to the small dog ring and it's like there, it's an extra probably three feet, three or four feet apart. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe this would be a better handling option for you. Or they'll say, oh yeah, you know, I can't do what you were going to do because look at the setup over here. So that's the kind of variation that we're talking about. And, and, you know, you've got very good course builders and judges at the nationals, but you still see those differences. Right. The last thing that I want to say is that, uh, a lot of times when you are setting something up in your backyard, you may not have the same exact jumps that are represented on paper. And the biggest difference may be wing or wingless. Ooh, and, and, and bar length. And right? bar Four length. Four or five That's right. bars are going to change your spatial relationships on the map. Absolutely. Good point. Right. Um, so one thing that you can do is, and if you have the coordinates – for your obstacles, those coordinates go to the center of the bar. So that takes care a little bit of the spatial relationships. If you're always setting the, the center of the bar at that coordinate, uh, you may end up with more space between things, but your, your relationships will be roughly correct. Um, but some people will have some wings, but maybe not as many as the course map calls for. And my advice would be to just Look for the best places to replace a wing with a wingless. Where When you're taking a jump straight on and it's kind of in flow, in a sequence, that's a great candidate for a jump that you could replace a winged with a wingless. If there's a jump that you are taking a backside, I would encourage you, because most organizations require that to be winged anyway, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to try to keep that a winged. Yes. And it, cause it really correct. does affect, um, the, the timing and the handling. And what a lot of people sometimes forget is that a lot of the maneuvers that we see in international handling were developed for courses where wingless jumps do not exist. 
So when you take some of these, you know, if you're working, uh, if you're practicing some of these more advanced skills, you want to try out some of these more, you know, international maneuvers, and you suddenly put it on a wingless, it may not even work as well, because you can't get to the positions that you need to get in. And it's a situation that uh, you'll never see in real agility. Okay, so that is true. But I'm going to give you a little bit of flip side. I do think that there are a lot of dogs who will um, use the wing to kind of judge the jumps rather than looking at the bar. Training back size on wingless jumps, you know, starting low and obviously progressing the height gradually can might help your dog jump a little bit better. And the other similarity there is if you've ever seen a dog use the tunnel bag as the entrance of the tunnel. So they will go and they will try and enter between the, the tunnel entrance and the bag itself, right? Because the tunnel bag is not all the way to the end of the tunnel. It's like two or three feet back. So it turns out that they've been using for years the tunnel bag to at, predict the to opening. predict the entry entrance of the tunnel. So you actually need to expose your dog to some tunnels where the bag's not always to the edge. This way if there's ever a trial where, you know, the the bag like is six inches back or something, your dog won't miss enter the tunnel and a refusal will be called, or more importantly, your dog jammed their neck or something. Because right. it's always ugly when you see it happen on accident um in practice. So kind of that same thing with the wings and wingless. Sarah's absolutely right. Um, in AKC Agility, backside, always going to be a wing. International, all they have is wings. But I do think there is some benefit to training on wingless jumps, even the backsides. And um, also be aware of the tunnel bags. Right. And yes. I agree that there's value, but I just think that it should be tactical. Like if you want to work on that, then consciously work on it. But if you just flip it out and you aren't paying attention, you may be surprised that things don't work the way you expected them to in terms of how you're handling a course or, you know, how you handled it versus how somebody on a video handled it. Mm. And that can be the difference there. And then the final thing that I'll say is that at the end of the day, as long as a course is safe, you should be able to run it. <laughs> you should have the skills to run it. You should be able to get through the course. So even if you have somehow changed the nature of the exercise, or let's say you miss number, right? You you don't notice that a jump is supposed to be the back instead of the front and you run the whole thing. Some people will go back and they'll feel dejected that they didn't run it, quote, right. I would say your dog did what you asked them to. You handled them through that course. That's a successful practice. So it, it, you know, even if there are small changes, if, if your dog is responding to you and you're handling, that's good practice for the two of you together. I agree. All right. So hopefully everyone has found this useful. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. And that's it for this week's podcast. Today's podcast was brought to you by Elite Science and Back on Track and was also brought to you by NTI Global. Visit NTI Global for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer shoots, tunnel shoots, tamer and ankle weight bags, along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Use promo code NTIAGILITY5 for 5% off. Happy training! What does gold say when you're trespassing? AU!